from tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is Monday afternoon, December the 31st, 1984. Norman Parrish is the speaker of the afternoon. This is tape two of two tapes on sickness and health. This tape is entitled, The Fear of the Lord. We're studying the relationship between sin and sickness. Yesterday morning I said that sickness is the direct or indirect result of what? Of sin. Sin is at the root of most sickness. I, I said uh, yesterday morning that I feel that there are a few, uh, few exceptions, things that happen uh, fortuitously. Uh, there are some accidents, there are some injuries that can, uh, can be a cause of disease that necessarily are not directly related to uh, some kind of sinful act or sinful habit. But most sickness is, is the result of some of the sins that we have committed down through the years. And if we can deal with a sin problem, we are dealing with the sickness problem. Many, many, time, many times I have uh, experienced in my own life that when we get, can get people to recognize their sin and confess their sin and renounce their sin, there is, uh, uh, and there, there perhaps will not even be a need to pray for them for healing. Sometimes the, the, the sickness just disappears automatically. It just seems to go away when the person is willing to face the fact that they have violated some of God's laws as, uh, as we can find them in the Word of God. Now, there's a direct relationship in the Word of God between the fear of the Lord and health. And we're going to look at at least two verses about this before we go into some other specific sins. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. So the Bible says here that if we, we fear God, we are going to depart from evil. And as a result, we will enjoy the best of health. There will be health in our body and there will be marrow in our bones. So just notice that. Well, the Bible here is defining what the fear of the Lord is. Fear of the Lord is not that trembling or that uh, uh, panicking before the presence of God that some people think it is. Fear of the Lord is something very, very practical. The Bible gives its own definitions. We can find the several definitions of what the fear of the Lord is right here in the book of Proverbs. If you'd like to turn with me, uh, I'll give you some scriptures right now. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Chapter uh, 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If we fear God, we are going to despise. We're going to abhor sin. We're going to hate it with a passion. We're going to hate sin as much as God hates sin. God hates sin because he knows what sin can do to the human race. God has down, down through the centuries has seen what Sin can do to us physically, morally, and spiritually. Sin is destructive. Sin is like a poisonous substance that circulates through our bodies and finally renders us uh, useful or dead, useless or dead. And so God hates sin. And if we are in, in agreement with God, we are going to hate what God hates. We're going to hate sin. And that's what the fear of the Lord is. Uh, the fear of the Lord is something very, very healthy because it brings spiritual health and brings physical health. Now notice again, the Bible says here, the, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, and we should ask God to place within us that abhorrence, that hatred towards sin, particularly towards the sins that so easily beset us. All of us are susceptible to sin. Not everybody is confronted with the same sinful inclination. What might tempt you might not tempt me, and vice versa. Uh, there are some people that have a, a serious problem with money. Uh, they're greedy, they're, they're uh, avaricious. Uh, the money it poses to them a serious problem because they don't know how, they, they don't know how to handle money. And they waste it or, or they hoard it. And money is, it, to them has become like a, a god. Now, uh, I believe and I can say publicly that I don't have that problem. Never have had that problem. Money to me doesn't mean that much. Uh, when I have money, I'm, I'm happy. When I don't have money, I'm happy. I've learned to, uh, I know that money is useful, useful. I know that money is valuable if you invest in the kingdom of God. But uh, uh, I haven't had uh, a financial problem. But... There are people here this afternoon that I sure have, I'm sure have had a problem with with money. 
That's why it's so hard for them to give. It's so hard for them to tithe. Uh, they, they have placed their confidence in their material wealth. Now, that's a sin. And we're going to study about that in a moment. We're going to study about greed and avarice and uh, covetousness. That's a sin. The love of money and the love of what money can produce is a sin. Because the Bible says it's a root. It's the root of all evil. It's one of the causes of many of the uh, emotional and physical problems of today. Uh, now, if we love, if we fear God, we are going to hate that sin. And we're going to ask God to place within our hearts uh, a holy hatred uh, towards that sin. Now, only God by His Spirit can quicken us or can awaken within us that hatred towards sin. That's going to spare us a lot of uh, turmoil and a lot of trouble in the years to come. Now, let's look at another verse here in uh, chapter 14, verse 16 of Proverbs. 14, 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. See, a wise man feareth. Feareth God and departeth from evil. But a fool, well, what does he do? He rages and, and is confident. He just, how could we say, he just uh, uh, bullies his way through. Uh, he's self-confident. Uh, many times, brethren, we get so self-confident, we don't think that uh, the particular sins that attack us or beset us can do us any harm. We see with the damage that that sin in particular is causing somebody else, but we think we can get away with it. We think we can avoid the problems that others have developed because of that particular sin. And that, the Bible says that we are foolish if we think that, because our sin sooner or later is going to find us out. Amen? Our sin sooner or later is going to cause the same results in our life that is caused in the results of millions of people that have practiced that individual sin. So we need to develop a healthy hatred Toward sin. And only the Spirit of God can give us that. Brethren, if we need, like I mentioned here probably two years ago when I gave a series on the fear of the Lord, if there's something that is needed in the body of Christ today is a restoration of that fear of God. Huh? Because see, fear of God will lead to repentance. Fear of God will lead to holiness. Fear of God will create the type of spiritual atmosphere in the church that will condu be conducive to revival. Uh, <clears throat> we need to be very, very sensitive to sin and its consequences. Now let's look at another verse, 16.6. 16.6, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So if we want to define the fear of the Lord, we'll say that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and depart from it. The fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, we hate sin so much that we're willing to give it up. We're willing to renounce it. We're willing to forsake it. We're willing to turn our backs on our sinful ways because we fear God. And this is something that we desperately need to de develop in our days. Now, what is the result, one of the many results of the fear of the Lord? We have seen it already in Proverbs 3, 7. It says that it will be health to our bodies. Let's go to uh, the book of um, Malachi. Malachi 4, 2. Malachi 4, 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the skull, and ye shall tread down the wicked. You can see here it says that to, if we fear God's name... What is going to happen? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come to us. He is the Son of Righteousness. He's going to come to us as our healer with healing in his wings. And we'll develop such strength, such energy. We'll be just like newborn calves. Uh, we'll run and, and trance. The Bible says here that we shall go forth and grow up as calves of the skull. That's Malachi 4, 2. So here we have some promises that if we fear God, God is going to give us help. God is going to reveal himself to us as our healer. We're going to discover in Christ Jesus the health, the strength that we need to lead a life that will be useful for the kingdom of God. Now, we're talking about sin as the cause of sickness, as the root cause of many of the illnesses that are so prevalent in the world and in the church today. And brethren, the remedy, well, the remedy is fearing God. Uh, because if, fear, if we fear God, we are not going to con continue to practice the same sins that we have practiced for so long. Our indulgence in certain sins will come to an end and we'll begin to clean up our lives. We'll begin to straighten up our lives. We'll begin to put our lives in order. Uh, we'll, we'll sanctify ourselves. We'll separate ourselves from those things that have caused us so much misery and so much uh, pain. The Bible says that we should depart from even the very appearance of sin. We should abstain from anything that would give people a, a, a right to doubt of our, uh, the, our conduct or our testimony before Christ. Okay, now let's look at uh, several other sins here in the Bible that are the cause 
of, sin, of sickness in the lives of those that indulge in them. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to study greed. Greed. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You know what a snare is? A trap. It's a demonic trap. And when you fall into a snare, you per lose your personal liberty. You're no longer able to make the, the, your cho the right choices. You're not able to make the right decision. Into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in dis destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, there's the spiritual uh, consequence, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now that word sorrows in the original is not, not uh, some kind of emotional strain, it's a physical infirmity. It's the, it's the word pain. Have pierced themselves through with many pains. So the love of money can affect us uh, spiritually, because the Bible says here that because of the love of money, many have erred from the faith. It can affect us morally, because it says that we are, <laughs> we fall into many hurtful lusts, and it can affect us physically, because we can pierce us through with many pains. And brethren, that's true. I, I, one of the most common causes of arthritis and, and, and rheumatism that I found uh, is, is the love of money. Greed. It's greed. It's covetousness. I've dealt with many people that come to me with arthritis, crippling arthritis, especially in their hands, that uh, as we pray for them, the Lord reveals that it's the love of money. It's, it's an uh, excessive love of money and, uh, what, uh, and what money can, can bring, the comfort, the luxuries that come from having an excessive amount of money. Now, is it wrong to have money? Let me ask you, is it wrong to have money? No, well, money itself is, 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 it can be a blessing. Uh, in fact, the more money you have, the more you can uh, spread it around. The more you can invest it in, in the work of God. The more you can use your money to further the cause of, of uh, Christ. The money can be invested in the kingdom of God. Just notice here in First Timothy chapter 6, in verse 17, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world. God's not condemning the rich. Uh, I've never found in the Bible a, a word of condemnation towards the rich. It's, it's the rich that hoard, the rich that, that keep to themselves. The wealth that God has given them, those are the ones that God condemns. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to us. Now, do you see that God wants us to prosper? Because God wants to give us all things richly, abundantly, so that we can enjoy them. I don't think somebody somebody has uh, a goodly amount of money that he should feel guilty for. It. He should accept that as a, gi a gift and a trust. God has in placed this money in his hands first of all, so that he can enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with eating well or dressing well or, or, or driving around in a good car or living in a, in a nice home. Uh, I grew up on the mission field and the, and the philosophy of missions back then was that missionaries uh, deserved the work. You had to live like a pauper. In fact, uh, when we would come home on furlough back in the early 40s, mid, middle 40s, we drove around in a beat-up old car uh, that broke down every second day and wherever we went, they have the missionary barrel. How many have heard about the missionary barrel? They, they, every, anything and everything that was beyond any serviceable use was put in the missionary barrel. Yes, you see bags. I, I told about that. We got a back, we got a back box from Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, we went through customs. We had to pay a pay a pile of money to get that thing out of customs. And when we opened it, there were some old socks with holes in them, or uh, used tea bags. And a lot of things, a lot of broken up, broken down toys, you know, just junk. And we paid more uh, for customs than, uh, than the whole thing was worth. And we, most of the things we had to throw away. We, we didn't use them. We didn't dare give them away. It would have been an insult, an insult to our people to have given those things away. But back then, people thought the missionaries should live in a, in a hovel, in an old shack with uh, dirt floors, no running water, no electricity, no sewers, no, none of the creature comfort. Well, praise God that that. That philosophy has changed. Uh, let me tell you something. I, I'm not ashamed to stand here and say that I live in a beautiful home. And the Lord gave us a home four or five years ago. After renting uh, houses and apartments for years, finally the Lord had mercy on us and gave us a beautiful home. Uh, and, uh, and, and the proof of the, of the fact that God had given us the home is that we, that we were able to pay everything cash on the barrel. We never got into debt while we built that home. And that home is paid 100% today. And it's a big home. And we've got six bedrooms, and we've got four baths. And and the reason why we asked God to give us a big home so we could entertain a lot of people. And we had people coming and going all the time. We had people 
that stopped to visit, ministers, missionaries, and, and we're able to house them. We're able to entertain them. And uh, we feel it's a privilege. Uh, we, uh, we believe in hospitality. And the Lord's blessed us because of that. But what I want to say this morning, is, is this afternoon, it's not wrong to have money as long as you use it wisely for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Now, God permits you to use uh, a certain percentage of that money for it to meet your own needs. See, the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that God gives us all things, including the material things, richly or abundantly so that we can enjoy them. But, but let's not stop there. That would be selfish. Verse 18 says that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. That word distribute means to share. Willing to communicate. The word communication in the New Testament means willing to distribute amongst those that are in need, those that don't have what God has given us. So you can see that God gives us all things to enjoy. God gives us all things to share. And brethren, that's the, that's the, the approach that we should have towards finance. I, I feel that probably the, what's being called the faith movement in the United States has gone overboard on the matter of prosperity. And, and, uh, and a lot of people are living, I don't know if this expression should be said from the pulpit, but they are living high on the hog. High on the hog right? And they're living, uh, and, and they're forgetting that there's a, a hungry world and that there's a dying world, and they're forgetting that out there there are millions of people that are uh, dying without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, God, God is willing to bless us, but not so that we can use it all on ourselves, because that would be self and a, a selfish approach. That would be greed. That would be covetous. And that could lead, brethren, to all kinds of complications, including physical disease as we have seen here. Remember that the word sorrow, there in uh, verse 10, is the word pain. It's the same, same word that you can find here in Matthew chapter 8, when it's talking about uh, Jesus' healing ministry. Here in Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Verse 17, it says uh, that it might be fulfilled that which, was, that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And that's the exact word that you can find there in Timothy. It's the word uh, pains or, or diseases or it has to do with a physical condition okay let's go on from there to Proverbs chapter 1 Proverbs chapter 1 if you, if you have been greedy ask God to deliver you from that before it kills you here Proverbs chapter 1 tells us some of the consequences of greed too Proverbs chapter 1 verse uh, verse 18 and 19 and they lay wait for their own blood they lurk privately for their own lives so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. What does greed do? It takes away our lives. Yeah? And when we are lay wait, uh, when we are greedy, we are laying wait for our own blood, and we are lurking privately for our own life. That means that we are going to suffer the consequences of our, our greed. We're going to suffer here in our own body. And greed can take away the life of the owners thereof. It can cause certain physical diseases that are, are destructive to our physical body. Psalm 10, verse 3. Psalms 10, 3. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. What's God add, God's attitude towards greed and covetousness? God hates it. And when you give in to greed, you are actually uh, being the... Uh, you, you become like... Uh, how will I'm, I'm looking for work. Uh, but you, you, you are exposing yourself to God's hatred and wrath. Amen? You become like an enemy to, 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 towards God. And how many of you would like to be enemies of God? Huh? How many of you would like for God to turn against you and God to begin to destroy the works of your hands? Huh? You, can, you can lose your property. You can lose your business. You can lose a lot of things if you permitted greed to take root in your own heart. Proverbs 28, 16. Proverbs 28. All these verses talk about greed. Proverbs 28, 16. Proverbs 28. All these verses talk about greed. The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor. Now notice this. But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. He that hateth greed shall prolong his days. You know, we, we can shorten our days or we can prolong our days. I used to think that, uh, you know, our days were, 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 were settled. Uh, that God had predetermined how long we were going to live. But you study this subject from the Bible, and you will see that God has left it in our own hands to determine how long we're going to live. We can lead long and, and happy lives. I mean, we can grow old 
We don't have to die when we're 30, and we don't have to die when we're 40. Uh, I think, brethren, uh, there are many promises in the Bible that affect the length and the quality of your life. How many believe that? Uh, what is the first command, commandment with promise? Love, honor, your mother, your father, so that what? So that your days might be long, lengthened. See? But by keeping that commandment, we are contributing to an extension of our own lives. We can lead a, a, a live a long life. You know, God has, has decreed in his word that the days of a man shall be 70 years. That's the minimum. That's exactly. And whenever you uh, get sick, and uh, perhaps you, you you come down with a very serious illness, and you're uh, actually at death's doors, and maybe you're entering into a comatose state, you can claim that promise. Uh, you can stand against that spirit of death that wants to cut your life off prematurely. You don't have to die young. And here's one promise that says that the covetous, and well, it's, it's more than a, it's more of a warning than a promise, but it says here that he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. There's no reason why Christian men and women should die at, a, at an early age. Did you hear that? And it would be service good and well for all of us to study this subject. Huh? There's a verse, and I know it in Spanish, I don't know in English, but it says that if we commit certain sins, we will not mediate our days. We won't even get to the half of the, of the length of, of age that God wants us to live. It, the Bible clearly shows that sin will shorten our lives and that holiness will extend our lives. Amen? Now, how many would like to live a, a long life? I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think we want to grow old and feeble. Huh? But remember what the Bible says about Moses and other men. That even when he was 120 years of old, he was still spry. He still had good eyesight. He had so much energy, he was able to even climb to the top of one of the highest mountains in that part of the world. Huh? And brethren, that's the way that God wants to keep us. God wants to keep us strong and vigorous and healthy. But naturally, we have to remember that sin is destructive and that if we tolerate any kind of sin in our life, that sin is going to shorten our days. Now, have you noticed that I haven't talked about those more outrageous sins? Uh, I haven't talked about those, those sins that we commonly discuss. No, we're talking about sins that so creep into our lives many times unaware. Huh? They're very subtle. They're sin, but they're sins that are very prevalent within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of those is greed. If it wasn't for the greed, uh, there'd be an abundance of money to support all these projects and all these ministries. Isn't that true? Uh, Brother uh, Miller was mentioning the fact that uh, the, for the few, first few days of this camp, not enough money came in even to pay the plane fare one of the speakers. Now, why didn't that money come in? Because there were a lot of greedy people around this camp. <laughs> Huh? Oh, they, they spent all their money on Christmas presents, mostly for themselves. Huh? And, but, but if, if we were delivered from greed, I tell you, there would not, there was, all the ministries would have more than enough to be able to move and to, and to minister to the needs of the human race. Okay? Now, there's a lot of verses on greed in the, in the New Testament, I'll tell you. In the Old Testament. Exodus 18. Exodus 18. Remember that we mentioned that uh, the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. And notice what it says here, and the fear of the Lord is, is to hate evil. Exodus 18:20. it says, Moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. You see the relationship? If you fear God, what are you going to do? Hate greed, hate covetousness. You'll hate all sin, but particularly this kind of sin. See, money is, is, is a god. And it's one of the, the gods of America today. Amen? The Bible says that we cannot serve God and Naaman at the same time. And Naaman was the god of wealth. Do you understand that? And so if we, we worship at the feet of this god, naturally we're not going to give like we should give for the furtherance of the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3, 5, it says that greed or covetousness is equivalent to what? To idolatry. Yes? Colossians 3, 5. You're setting up another God before you. You're trusting more in your money than you're trusting in your God. Colossians 3, 5. Just notice how it reads. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Yes. Rebellion is, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, is, uh, is, um, is related to idolatry. And here we find covetousness related to idolatry. 
Amen? So let's be careful, brethren, uh, what our attitude is towards money and everything that is related to money. Our properties, our belongings, anything that we have bought that we purchased uh, with money can become a God unto himself. It can become a God that will substitute uh, the true and living God in our lives. Okay? Now let's look at uh, Proverbs 15:27. I'm just giving you a series of texts, and I hope that you're jotting them down. You can study these matters with a little bit more of, uh, of dedication when you get home. Proverbs 15, 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts or hateth bride shall live. So notice this. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. There, once again, we have to identify what this word house means. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 calls the human body what? The earthly house of our habitation. So if you're greedy again, you're going to trouble your own body. There's the physical consequence. The love of money is going to bring re repercussions upon your own physical body. Your, your body is going to become weakened and finally diseased because of this particular type of sin. Did you know before this afternoon that greed or covetousness was so, was so serious, was so grievous in the sight of God? And it's one of the sins you very seldom hear preached about. But it's a sin that must be dealt with if we want to enjoy the life that God has in store for us through Jesus Christ. I think I'll give you just one more verse that deals with greed or covetousness. And it's here in Isaiah 57, 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me and was wroth. Now, what God is speaking. This is a word that's coming from the Lord God of hosts. What is he saying? For the iniquity of his greed, or the iniquity of his covetousness, I was wrong, and I hid myself from him. Do you want to lose the consciousness of God's presence in your life? Do you want God's presence to depart? Well, brethren, give in to greed. Give in to covetousness. Give in to avarice. Give in to these sins that are related with money. And the Bible says that God will be wroth with you. And when God becomes angry, then naturally he must take some very stern measures. He must punish. He must correct. And one of the ways is to withdraw his presence from our lives. Uh, we no longer feel his presence. We no longer feel his blessing. blessing. We feel that God has forsaken us. Uh, brethren, isn't it true that sometimes, sometimes in our life we lose the consciousness of the presence of God and we wonder why? We ask ourselves, what's, going, what's happening, Lord? I haven't committed adultery. I haven't robbed. I haven't, I haven't murdered. Uh, we only think about those major sins. See, we've classified sins. But sin is sin. All sin is damnable. Amen? Both to our body and, both, and to our soul. But we always, when we talk about sin, we're only thinking about those sins that the world uh, looks on with abhorrence. No. Even these sins that seem to be so insignificant can have some very serious, bring serious results in our lives. It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Amen? So how many now realize that greed can bring upon you physical infirmities. How do you know it? By the scripture. This is not vain speculation. This is scriptural teaching because we have read verses and chapters where the Bible condemns greed and tells us that if we are greedy of gain, we will suffer the consequences in our own physical structure. Amen. Now let's go on to another sin. That's the sin of rebellion. Now we're going to step on a, a few other toes this afternoon. Amen. Rebellion. We dealt with rebellion uh, a couple days ago. In passing. But rebellion also can bring physical consequence. Let's go to the book of Psalms. We're, talking, we're studying this today about the, relation, the relationship between sin and sickness, sin and disease. Psalm 107, verses 17 through 20. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in the trouble, and he saves them out of their distress. But notice this. Sins, uh, fools, because of their transgression. In the, in the original, the word is because of their rebellion. Because they have transgressed the laws of God. They've rebelled against God's stringent laws. Now notice that, brethren. To rebel is an act of, uh, of foolishness. Anybody that rebels against God and God, then God's delegated authority is proving that he is utterly foolish. It's madness. Sheer madness. When, when Balaam rebelled against God, you can read in, uh, in Peter and you can read in Jude that it says that God, the, that a, a mute beast had to what? Rebuke the madness of the prophet. The madness. 
And, and, and brother, when we, we rebel against God and against God's principles and God, against God's leader, we are actually committing an, an act of madness. Because we are going to suffer the consequences. And one of the consequences is physical infirmity. And here you see that it talks about certain people that had transgressed God's laws, had violated God's laws, had rebelled against God and against the laws that he had established. And what was the result? It says here in verse 18, their soul abhorreth all man or meat. Isn't it true that we lose our appetite when we're sick? One of the first evidences of uh, the, the development of physical infirmity in our bodies is when we lost, have a loss of appetite. We no longer want to eat. Even the, even the things that are our favorite dishes no longer appeal to us. And we shoved them both to one side. We have lost our desire to eat. And it says here, and they draw near unto the gates of death. That's the result of, uh, of rebelling against God. Okay, let's read Isaiah 63.10. Rebellion can kill us, not only spiritually, but physically. Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. How many of you would like to have the Holy Spirit as an enemy? We like to have the Holy Spirit on our side, favoring us, guiding us, instructing us. But here the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can turn against us and become our enemy. And he'll fight against us. He'll destroy the work of our hands. Instead of favoring us, he'll oppose us in everything that we do. And why? But they rebelled. And what else? And they vexed his Holy Spirit. You know, there's seven different kinds of sins that we can commit against the Holy Spirit. And one of those is to vex the Holy Spirit or harass the Holy Spirit. And how we do that? How do we do that? By what? By rebelling against the Word of God. When we rebel, then the Holy Spirit becomes angered. He becomes irritated. And he turns against us. He becomes our enemy. And instead of favoring us, he opposes us. And that's one of the results of uh, a rebellion. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one that ministers health to our bodies as, as well as to our souls. He takes the things that are of Christ and applies them to us. And all the, uh, the blessings of Calvary are made available to us by the Holy Spirit. Salvation is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Healing is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Deliverance is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? He takes the things that belong to Christ and makes them real to us. But when we rebel against God... The Holy Spirit no longer ministers to our needs. Actually, we are, are lift, raising up a barrier that even the Holy Spirit cannot break through. That's the, the seriousness of rebellion. Now, rebellion against God can be manifested in the home, in the school, in the church, or anywhere. Because when you rebel against God's delegated authority, you are rebelling against whom? Against God. God placed that person over you. And your responsibility is to submit to that person whether you agree with him or not. And we have many lessons on uh, authority and in, on submission in the Bible. But brethren, when we are not willing to recognize that principle of authority that is being manifested in our home or in our church, in our school, in our community, and we rise up against those that are in authority because we don't agree with them. We don't like the way they act. We don't like the way they conduct business. We don't like the way uh, they treat us. Well, we're going to have to suffer the consequences. And one of the consequences is what? Physical suffering. Amen, brethren? Boy, it's quiet here this afternoon. Now, we can, let's look at Proverbs 17, 11 again. I gave you this verse the night, uh, I believe the night before last. And what does Proverbs 17, 11 say? An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. How many have discovered that demons are cruel? They'll tear you to shreds if they're able to. They hate you with a passion. We heard from... Uh, Brother Pittman, that hate, uh, demons hate the whole human race, especially those that are a part of the, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Demons look on us as enemies, enemies that they're out to destroy. And if we give them grounds, and if we give them rights, brethren, they'll do everything they can to wipe us off the face of the earth. And the Bible says here that when we give in to rebellion, we are attracting evil spirits. Cruel, and a cruel messenger will be sent against us. That cruel messenger, which is a demon, will punish us and will inflict us with pain and will uh, cause all kinds of misery in our lives. Okay, Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. We're talking about rebellion. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. You have a choice. You always have a, a right to choose. And you can find it here in verse 19 and 20. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall, be, shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel... Ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Do you have a choice between life and death? 
between health and sickness. If you be willing and you be obedient, if you submit to the will of God, uh, you will eat the fat of the land. And that, the word fat there, uh, refers to uh, uh, the type of food that will strengthen you, nourish you, and give you the, all the vitality you need to live a long and healthy life. Amen? But if you rebel and you refuse to do God's will, what's going to happen? You will be devoured. That's, they're talking about death. Uh, how many of you have read there in... in First Peter, where it says that the devil, like a roaring lion, uh, is gadding round about us, seeking whom he devour. There's the same word, devour. The enemy will swallow us up if we rebel against God. Brethren, we should constantly examine our hearts in the matter of rebellion, because rebellion sneaks in. It's very tricky. It's very sly. It has the ability to infiltrate our lives sometimes unwittingly. We're not aware of what's happening. But rebellion is one of the most grievous sins that we can commit against God. Let's go to Ephesians 2.2 2, uh, <coughs> in re reference to rebellion. Where in the time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power air of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Are you a child of disobedience? Are you stubborn? Are you capricious? Are you obstinate in your designs? Are you self-willed? Are you always wanting to impose upon others your own will? Are you willful in your ways and your attitudes? Now, the Bible says that there is a spirit, a particular spirit, that works in the children of disobedience. And it's not a puny spirit. It's not one of a spirit of second or third degree. What is it? A prince. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh where? In. In. Not around. It says in the children of disobedience. And brethren, if we are disobedient to the word of God, if we rise up in rebellion against God and his word and God in his delegated authority, we are subject in ourselves to evil spirits. Rebellion will attract some of the worst spirits that can flutter around those that have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're cruel and they're persistent. And uh, many times these spirits are hard to, 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 get, to get rid of. Uh, I've dealt with many spirits of rebellion. And I tell you, brethren, they put up quite a fight. They're stubborn. They're determined to, to hold on to the ground that they have uh, acquired in the life of the believers. And so, brethren, rebellion is a sin that will bring very serious consequences in your life. And one of the consequences of rebellion is what? Disease. Your body will become diseased. This sin, as all sin, will cause physical infirmities in your body. Now, let's go to another sin here. We can find it in the book of Proverbs. And this is the sin of ungratefulness. Or this is the sin of ingratitude. Now, how many of us have been guilty of this sin? I don't think there's one single person in this building tonight that hasn't been ungrateful to those that have blessed them some way or another. We've been ungrateful to our parents, and to our teachers, to our pastors, to our employers. We've been ungrateful to all of not We haven't learned to express our appreciation either by word or by deed. Remember when Jesus ministered to ten lepers? Huh? That's in Luke 17, 11 through 19. He healed ten lepers. He, he commanded these ten lepers to go and show themselves to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. Their body was totally restored. Their skin was restored as the skin of a child. Now, what did the ten do? Nine went on their own way. They went to speak for their friends and neighbors and relatives. They went to celebrate their, their good luck, their good fortune. And only one turned around and went back to seek for whom? For Jesus. But you know... This man, because of his gratitude, had a double blessing. Uh, the nine were healed physically, but this man was healed physically and spiritually. Because he was not only healed, but he was saved. Thy faith has saved thee. So he, he received not only a temporary blessing, which was healing, but he received an eternal blessing, which was salvation. So you can see, brethren, that when we are grateful, we open the doors to further blessing. Uh, when we are grateful for the least, then God charged upon us the most. Okay? Now let's look at this verse here in Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17, verse 13. We're talking about ingratitude. Whosoever rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Now there's the reward that we will receive if we are ungrateful. If someone has done you a good deed and you reward him with evil, what are you going to bring upon yourself? Evil shall not depart from your house, from your physical body. This is our, the earthly house of our habitation. 
And we're going to suffer the consequences physically in many other different ways. But it says here, if we reward, pay back, repay, evil for good. And brother, how many times have we done that? I've, I've been uh, uh, the object of a lot of ingratitude because you, know, you lead people to the Lord, you help them, you serve them. Uh, through your prayers, these people come into an understanding of the word. They enter into a, a life of deliverance and health. And then suddenly, for some unknown reason, they turn against you. And they go around maligning you. And they, they go around attacking you. And they dare try to tear you down. They try to destroy your reputation, destroy your ministry. Now, I've learned to not do a thing about that type of people. I just learned to keep my mouth shut. Because I know that the Lord is a revenger of such things. Amen? Uh, God will repay them amply for what they have done. Because the Bible says here that if we reward evil for good, evil shall not depart from our house. And I've seen it time after time after time how these people lose out with God. And they begin, begin to suffer financial reverses. They begin, they begin to suffer physical maladies. Uh, their home is disrupted. The children run away. And all kinds of terrible things begin to happen to people that are not grateful. Amen? Now, one of the results of ingratitude is physically, is physical. Let's go to Psalm 109. How many have heard about the sin of ingratitude? Have you ever heard a message on that? We, we, we love to hear about end times truths, and we love to hear about things way out in the deep blue yonder, you know. All these mysteries and all these fantasies that are being spouted in the body of Christ. But, you know, we need to, somebody come and tell and talk to us about the nitty-gritty of Christian living, isn't it? The Lord, from time to time, tells me, why don't you get back to basics? Especially when I tend to, to go way beyond you know, the limits that God has imposed upon us. I believe in end time truth. I believe in sonship. I believe in a lot of things that God is going to do in, in these days that lie ahead. I believe that we were going to see a restoration of the prophetic ministry, of the angelic ministry. And we're going to see tremendous visitations from God. But brethren, before that happens, we've got to begin to live as Christians ought to live. And that's where uh, I think God has delayed the fulfillment of many of his promises, his promise that God has given through uh, a prophetic voice 20, 30, 40 years ago. God has delayed the fulfillment because God's people haven't gotten ready. They haven't created an atmosphere that is conducive to this kind of manifestation. Now, let's read here uh, Psalm 109. Well, let's read verse 4. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto pray, prayer. See, you don't have to do anything about this matter except pray. When some of you have showered somebody with your love and then they turn against you and they become your adversary, don't you feel that you've got to take them to court or that you've got to haul them into the church board? Just leave the matter in God's hand. He's able to take care of it. Verse 5, And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. That is the result. What happens, brethren, when people are ungrateful? Satan's going to be sent at their right hand. There's the demonic. The ingratitude, just as much as any other sin, attracts evil spirits. Satan will be sent at your right hand when you be not an ungrateful wretch. And anybody that's ungrateful is a wretch. Hmm? We are wretched people when we are not able to recognize that we have been greatly favored by people that, out of just love, have served us. There would be no other purpose just to, they've loved us, they've served us, and yet we have turned our backs on them, and we've been the instruments in Satan's hands to even tear down the good reputation. Psalm 7, verse 4. If I have rewarded evil to him that it was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without a cause is mine enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Now notice the condition in verse 4. If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, that means if I reward evil to someone that has been friendly and someone that has been helpful, someone that, that has served me well, if I reward evil to that person, what's going to happen according to verse 5? Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. We will become imprisoned by evil spirits. Spirits will take a hold of our soul and drag it to the dust. You see that, brethren? Huh? Do you see that in, in the scripture? No, I'm not inventing this. In Psalm 109 and in Psalm 7, it says plainly that if we repay, reward evil for good, and that's ingratitude. If we reward evil for evil, that's revenge. But if we reward evil for good, that's ingratitude. Now, if we are ungrateful, we are going to attract the attention of evil spirits. Evil spirits will be placed around us. God will send evil spirits 
to punish us for our unfaithfulness. Amen, brethren? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 20. Here's another verse that talks about the consequences of ingratitude. Excuse me, Jeremiah 18, 20. Shall evil be recompensed for good? Now, he, the prophet here is talking about himself. He had delivered God's message. He had been faithful in warning God, the, God's people about the events that were going to take place if they persisted in our, on their course of action. And yet they rewarded him evil for good. They shall evil be recompensed for good, for they have dipped dip, 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 for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them. I prayed for them. I interceded for them. And, turn, and to turn away thy wrath from them. Therefore, there's the consequences. Deliver up their children to the famine, and pour out their blood by the force of the sword. And let their children be bereaved, their wives be bereaved of their children, and be widowed. And let their men be put to death, and let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Huh? Isn't that terrible? Huh? It's very, the scripture in this case is very, very plain spoken. And brethren, I think many of us here in this afternoon need to repent of that sin. There's people here that have risen up against ministers of the gospel, that have slandered them, that have accused ministers of the gospel of things real or imaginary, that have caused serious problems in fellowships all over this country. Now, I don't know anybody in particular. I'm not pointing my finger at anyone. But if this body of believers here is like most body of believers, there's a lot of people here this afternoon that have done just what I said before. And it's, it's a dreadful sin in the sight of God. And it's a sin that brings consequences that sometimes are irreversible. So ingratitude can kill you. You don't gonna have, have to go out and steal and go out and, and, and murder and go out and commit adultery to bring uh, God's wrath upon yourself. Just be ungrateful and show your ingratitude by turning against those people that have served you well. Just go around talking about them. Go around gossiping. Go around slandering. And brother, sister, the consequences will speedily come. This can be one of the reasons why you have been prayed for by some of the great evangelists. You've gone to Oral Robert meetings, Kenneth Hagin's meetings, uh, Jimmy Swaggart's meetings. You've flown across the country and you haven't been healed because there's something interfering with the manifestation of the power of God in your life. And that something is called sin. And that sin might be the sin of what? Of ingratitude. Okay, we studied three sins today. First, we studied greed. Then we studied rebellion, and then we studied ingratitude. Now we're going to study another one, and I call this sin the sin of cruelty. When you are harsh and judgmental, when you treat people drastically, and this can happen right in the home. Many times husbands are cruel with their wives. Many times parents are cruel with their children. There's no love. Love is not expressed in that home. Uh, and the way you treat your loved ones with, in such, in, 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 with cruelty, you know, uh, a lot of divorces are granted on the basis of what? Mental cruelty. Because the husband has ignored his wife, or his, uh, the, wife, uh, the husband has neglected his wife. And they go to court and they accuse the husband of uh, mental cruelty. Well, cruelty is a sin. Amen? And we're going to see the results of, men of cruelty, whether it be physical or mental. Amen. Let's look through Scripture again today. I have some verses here for you. Proverbs 11.17. Proverbs 11.17. I, need, I think this word needs to be studied more. But I'll leave you some pointers at least. 11.17 The merciful man doth good to his own soul. But he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. He that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Mercy will do you good. Cruelty will do you harm. Cruelty is the opposite to mercy. If you're not merciful with people and you have learned to tolerate them, and you've learned to forgive them. Uh, if you hold things against people, uh, you're cruel. A lack of mercy is cruelty. Amen? Do you want to see that? Here in the book of Jeremiah, uh, a lack of mercy is cruelty. Jeremiah 50, 42. They shall hold the bow in the lance. They are cruel and will show no mercy. When you are cruel, you show no mercy. You're ruthless. You're judgmental. And brethren, let me tell you something. In the body of Christ, there's a lot of cruelty today. The church is the only army that destroys its own casualty. The church is the only army that destroys the victims of spiritual warfare. And how fast we pass judgment upon people. Isn't that true? That's cruelty. Uh, when we pass judgment on people without knowing the facts, uh, you shouldn't judge anybody unless you uh, stand in their own boots. Uh, you don't know the circumstances that have led to that error, to that sin. And you should be very careful to wag your tongue. Because when you talk against somebody because that person has failed, 
uh, you're placing yourself in jeopardy. Just notice what it says here in Proverbs about those that pass judgment on others. Proverbs 30.10 Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found, found guilty. Accuse not a servant before his master, lest he curse thee. When you accuse somebody, and you accuse him before his master, which is God, what's going to happen? You're going to bring a curse upon yourself. Amen? When you are cruel, when you are ruthless, when you are merciless, merciless, and you accuse a person before God and before man, you're going to bring a curse upon yourself. Amen? There in Romans chapter 14, verse 4. See, when you accuse somebody, it's out of a lack of mercy, it's out of a lack of love. The Bible says that love covereth what? A multitude of sins. And anybody that goes around stripping people of their honor and their reputation and exposing their sin, making their sin known far and wide, is showing a lack of mercy, a lack of love. He's cruel. Because he doesn't sit down to, to think about the damage that he's causing that person, his family, his church, the, the damage that he's causing to the body of Christ at large. He doesn't care. He's spiteful. He's cruel. Now, Romans chapter 14, 4 says this, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Who is the master in this case? According to Romans 14, 2, 4. God. And you have no right to judge, and you don't have, have no right to accuse anybody before his master. If you somebody see somebody committing a mistake, committing a sin, somebody that is failing miserably in his Christian life and testimony, it's true. Take him to the Lord, but don't go to accuse him before God. Ask God to be merciful for that, towards that person. Ask God to help him, to bring him to his senses, to bring him to repentance. Uh, but don't go and accuse him before God. And I tell you, brethren, many times in prayer meetings, uh, prayer meetings are accusation meetings, especially when you ask for prayer requests. Some people get, oh, brothers, uh, let's pray for sister so-and-so. You know what, it is. and we begin to spill the beans. We tell everybody what, what's happening in that person's home that person's life. And it sounds so pious, but it's showing, brethren, that there is a degree of cruelty in our hearts, in our lives. Okay, let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 25. Here's an example of a man that was cruel. How many have heard about, uh, have heard about Nabal? Nabal. Nabal and Abigail. Have you read that story? David was fleeing from Saul. He was hiding in the wilderness. And there was a wealthy man called Nabal that had a lot of sheep. A lot of cattle. And David, out of his own good heart, began to protect the shepherds and the cattle. For months, he, he, he protected them from uh, their enemies, both human and, uh, and animal. And out, uh, there came a time of the year when Nabal decided to shear his sheep. And this was a time of reveling. This was a time of feasting. So when David heard that they were shearing the sheep, he sent some of his boys over to ask uh, Nabal to share of his bounty. Uh, they were barbecuing some of the sheep and some of the goats. And they were just having a, a ball. He said, well, now's the time for Nabal to show his gratitude by sharing with us of his bounty. Now, when, when David's men spoke with Nabal, what did Nabal say? Just notice what he said here in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15. No, no. Did I say 15? 1 Samuel 25. Yeah, I'm way behind. Here in verse 10, And Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He was accusing uh, David of rebelling against his master, against Saul, running away. Uh, verse 11, Shall I take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it to men unto men whom I know not whence they be? Uh, actually, what was he doing? Scolding, chiding, upbraiding. Uh, here in the verse, verse 14, towards the end, he used the word railed. He was railing against them. He was treating them with scorn, with derision. He was showing cruelty. Well, that's, that's understandable because in verse 3 it describes this man. Chapter 25, verse 3, it says, Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Ab Ab Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and a, of a beautiful countenance, but the man was what? What does it say there in your Bible? Churlish. And then my, the margin of the, uh, the, bio, the version that I have, it, it says he was cruel. He was harsh. Now, uh, you see here, a good woman married with an evil man. And this still happens today. And vice versa. Uh, but this man was cruel. Says that he was churlish and evil in his doing. It, it, it isn't strange that, then that when David's servants came to him to ask for uh, some kind of a, a recompense for all his efforts, for all his sacrifices, that this man turned them away empty-handed. 
Now, how did David react to that? Was he happy? He wanted to take up his arms and go against the man. And if it hadn't been because Abigail came to meet him, stopped him on his track, made him uh, think over what he was going to do, that David would have killed Nabal and Abigail and perhaps many, many of his servants. Now, let's notice what happened, brethren. Abigail told him, just leave the matter in God's hand. She even recognized that his, her husband was a man of Belial. You can see that here in verse 25. A man of Belial. Belial is an Old Testament name for whom? For Satan. Actually, she was saying that my husband is just full of the devil. He's demon-possessed. He's a man of Belial. He's cruel. He's, he's harsh. He's, he's a man that's full of evil spirits. So just leave it in God's hands. That's exactly what she told him. In uh, verse 26, she talked about... She told David, don't take this matter into your own hands. Don't take revenge. She said, just leave this matter in God's hand. God will take care of it. And so, uh, let's notice how God dealt with this situation in verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. What did he have? Massive heart pain. Huh? He had a congestive heart condition or a massive heart condition. He just... Actually, his whole body was paralyzed. His whole body became like a stone. He lost sensitivity. He lost movement. And then notice the following verse, verse 38 says, And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal and he died. What killed Nabal? His cruelty. His cruelty. Sooner or later, it had to kill him. And the disease that he had developed, developed in his heart and in his circulatory system. He had congestive Heart failure. He had a heart attack that left him paralyzed, and ten days later, he died. Huh? Do you see what cruelty can do to you? Are you cruel with your children? Are you cruel with your animals? The reason why the Lord led me to give this message is so that we could examine our own lives. Huh? We should judge ourselves and not others. What does verse 39 say? Yeah, and when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach. For the Lord hath returned the witness of Nabal upon his own head. That's exactly what happened. Okay, we've seen another sin, brethren, that is common in many homes. Cruelty. I've seen men that won't talk to their wife for weeks at, at, at end. They come home and they won't even greet their wives or kiss their wives. They act like the wife was, wasn't there. They turn the television set on and they look at the news and they look at the sports and they go to bed and they, they sleep in another room and they ignore their wives. Walk out in the morning without saying goodbye. They're punishing their wife, trying to break their will, trying to break their, their well, whatever they're, they're seeking to do. Yes? You know, is, is that right? No. Is, in Christians? No. Yeah. And what will it lead to? Come on now. Uh, it can lead to heart attack. <laughs> it can lead to heart attack. You see, brethren, that a breakdown in our physical health is not just a matter of uh, happens chance. It's not coincidental. The loss of health is usually the result of our transgression or transgressing what? God's laws as they pertain to diet, sex, family relationships, etc., etc., etc. We can't violate God's laws without suffering the consequence. Amen? See, God has given his laws to protect us. You know, there's a lot of laws in the, in the, in the Bible that deal with, with our home, our, our marriage and home life, and, and, and we try to ignore those laws, and we try to go on our happy way and live our lives uh, independently and just treat our wives and our children in whatever way we think best. But we're going to suffer the consequences. We're going to bring upon ourselves uh, serious consequences that later will render us probably uh, useless. A man with uh, this kind of heart problem will just kind of uh, drag himself through life. The rest of his days he'll, he'll be useless to himself and to his family and to his church and to his God. Well, brother, let's prevent that. If we have that kind of disposition, if we are harsh and judgmental and merciless and cruel, it's time we change our ways. Amen, brethren? Now, let's talk about another sin that is very common in the body of Christ, and that's fear. How many would like to study about fear for a while this afternoon? But I, let's, let's relate fear to illness. Uh, fear can cause various types of sicknesses. Let's go to Luke chapter 21, 26. This is prophetic, brethren, because what is the number one killer in America today? Not cancer, but what? Heart condition. And here we find in Luke 21, 26, it says, Men's hearts failing them for what? Fear. Fear. 
You know, there's 270 odd kinds of fear. If you, if you go through a, an encyclopedia or a dictionary, you'll find many of these fears listed. And every one of these fears can affect you physically. And one of the areas of your body that is most affected by fear is your heart and your circulatory system. Now let's look at <coughs> Psalms 55. Psalm 55, 4 and 5. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. Now what is the cause of this sore pained heart? Uh, my heart is sore pained within me. What do you call that pain that courses up and down your shoulder and your left arm? Angina. It, it starts in the heart and it runs up and down your left shoulder and your left arm. My heart is so pain within me. And what was the cause of this condition? According to Psalm 55, 4 and 5. Fear, fearfulness, and trembling, terror. In fact, notice in verse 3 it talks because of the oppression of the wicked one. Because of oppression. Fear will bring oppression upon you and that oppression will affect your heart. And your heart will be so pain. See, we need to discover these things because if we discover them and we uh, apply them, we can prevent these diseases from latching on to our physical body. Amen? There's no reason why any man inside this building today should die of a heart attack. Did you know that? And if you die of a heart attack, it's because you permit a heart attack to happen, take place in your life. See, a lot of people, uh, we talk about stress. The stress many times comes because we are afraid of not measuring up. We're not afraid of not being able to fulfill our obligations. We're afraid of not being able to hold on to our job. We're afraid of not being able to please our employer. And so we drive ourselves and drive ourselves and drive ourselves, and that tension builds up till it kills us. But behind the tension, behind the stress and strain, you can find what? Fear. Fear. Let's go to the book of Job. Yet when you study the book of Job, you have to study it from both sides of the coin. You've got to look at it from the heavenly scene. You've got to look at it from the earthly scene. Now, if we study only Job chapter 1, we will discover that Satan presented himself before God and asked for permission to attack Job. And he attacked Job in his, his, uh, through his family and through his uh, property and through his health. Now, Job came down with a, 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 what we would call perhaps an incurable disease. What did he develop? A skin disease. Uh, it's called in the Bible boils, but it's really high. In fact, uh, I think what Job developed in, in our Spanish Bible is called the mange. You know what the mange is? It's a skin disease that attacks mostly what? Animals. But it can attack human beings. And it's very irritant. It's very painful. Uh, and Job would scratch himself uh, till he wore his thumbs and his nails out, and then he took what? A piece of pot shirt and scratched and scratched and scratched until it became infected. He was just a, a running, oozing sore from head to toe. He stank to high heaven. His wife wouldn't even let him in the house. Huh? Uh, we would say that he developed a lot of allergies. I think allergies, most allergies are demonic. Most allergies are demonic. That's been my experience, in my own personal experience in the spirit and, and in the lives of others. But anyway, we know that it's true that Satan was able to attack Job because God granted him permission. But there must have been some legal grounds. Huh? And what were the legal grounds? How many read Job 3.25? Huh? What did Job 3.25 and 26 have to say? For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. All his life he was afraid of losing his health, of coming down with an incurable disease. And you know, fear does the same as faith. But, let's put it in this way, in the opposite sense. Faith creates. Fear destroys. Amen? So he had fear. He was afraid of getting sick. And I'll tell you something today, brethren, because of all the propaganda that flooded us through the newspapers and through the television ads, a lot of people here this afternoon have afraid, are, fear, are afraid of cancer. Huh? And every time a little lump develops in your body, you think you've got cancer. No, every time a little pain develops in your body, you think you've got cancer. Huh? Let's be honest today. How many of you have been, are afraid of, of, of cancer? Raise your hand. Fear of cancer is one of the most common fears in the body of Christ, especially if some members of your family have, been, have died because of cancer. And there's some of you who weren't honest with God. You didn't raise your hand, but it's true. Huh? And let me tell you something, brethren. If you give in to that fear, you're going to get cancer. You're going to get cancer. Because fear, what you fear will happen. Let's there's some verses that will, will prove this to us this afternoon. Proverbs 1.26. That comes to corroborate, to confirm what we read there in the book of Job. 1.26. 
I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. I will laugh when your fear, or I will mock when your fear, what? When your fear cometh. That means that, that what you fear will come to pass. Proverbs 10, 26, or 24. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him. Isaiah 66, verse 4. I also will choose their delusions, I, and bring their fears upon them. Isaiah 66, 4. Here we have the testimony of Solomon, we have the testimony of Isaiah, that whatever you fear is going to come upon you. And brother, we can reject our fears. We can overcome our fears. I remember several years ago, I went through one of the many crises in my ministry. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm the most courageous person, but uh, I don't think I'm, I'm beset by fears. I couldn't be a missionary in the area where I'm working if I was fearful. I couldn't travel as widely as I do if I, if I was fearful. And uh, uh, my children are, 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 are fearless because we transmit our fears to our children. Huh? The demons we have, we, we transfer them to our children. And we're the ones that create fear in our children. But anyways, uh, oh, it must have been seven, eight years ago. I don't remember when, but I went through one of the crises. Probably it was my midlife crisis. You know, men also have go through the menopause. <laughs> Did you hear, have you heard about that? Men about 40, 45 go through a midlife crisis. And uh, they go through a time of uh, when they doubt their ability and they uh, doubt... Uh, that they'll ever reach the goals that they have set in life and a lot of things. So, and you know, for about a period of two or three weeks, I was beset by fear. I was attacked by a spirit of fear. I could feel that spirit of fear wherever I went. It, 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 it just kind of came and uh, clothed me and surrounded me. And it was driving me insane. Uh, I couldn't function normally. As a husband, as a father, I just couldn't fulfill my, my duties in life. When Sunday, I, I woke up and said, what am I doing? I don't have any reason. There's no reason why I should uh, uh, tolerate this thing. Uh, I began to discern that it, wasn't, it was not a feeling, that it was a spirit. And brethren, I began to bind that thing and attack that thing. And within about two days, it was gone. And it has never returned since then. Right, yeah. huh? And many of us are beset by fears. And we don't have to tolerate those fears. Because those fears can cause skin diseases, can cause heart diseases. Those fears can cause all kinds of physical problems. And, and no matter what we do later on to try to uh, correct those physical situations, as long as the fear is there, they're going to, it's going to crop up over and over and over again. Huh? Whatever medicine is able to do for us will just be of temporary nature until we get rid of our fears. Fear is an enemy. It's a deadly enemy. And we shouldn't permit a fear to continue to operate in our hearts. Well, there's a lot of things that we can talk about fear. Fear is a sin. How many believe that fear is a sin? Huh? Now, psychology has permeated the body of Christ to the point that we look upon fear as something, well, some kind of emotional uh, maladjustment, something like that. But brethren, fear is sin. You remember when the disciples were going through across the Sea of Galilee and a great storm broke out? Now, these disciples, most of them were, were fishermen. They had, they had uh, grown up by the, the Sea of Galilee. They knew the Sea of Galilee like you know the palm of your hand. They were used to all the currents. They were used to all the storms. But this storm was of such a nature that they began to fear and to tremble. They went and woke Jesus up. They shook him away. And they said, Lord, aren't you worried? Aren't you concerned? Here we're, we're all going to drown. Now, and fear will do silly things with you. will make you think and say silly things. Because they should have sat down to analyze the situation. They said, Jesus is asleep. Uh, if we're going to drown, he's going to drown first. At least we're awake and we can wade or we can swim or we can float. But Jesus will just go around like a, a, a lump of lead. He'll just go right down to the bottom of the sea. They should have said, well, we'll follow his example. We'll stop rowing and we'll stop, uh, what is it, dishing out the water, huh? bailing, and we'll just lie down and sleep. Huh? No, but they got frantic. And so they woke Jesus up. And Jesus, you know, in his kindness and his love, he didn't say a word at first. He just got up and still the seas and... And he stilled the waves, the waves and the wind. And then he turned to them and he said, what? Why did you fear, fear ye men of what? Little faith. And that which is not of faith is sin. sin. So fear is what? Sin. And brethren, look at it as sin. Look at it as a sin. It's a sin that will open you up to a spirit of fear. There, there's a problem many of us in deliverance. 
faith is that we sometimes we don't know when a particular thing has ceased being a sin and has become a spirit. See, jealousy is a, is a sin, or is it a sin? It's listed amongst the works of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, it's called emulations, or jealousy. Yet if you go to the book of Numbers chapter 5, you'll find that jealousy is listed as a what? As a spirit, the spirit of jealousy that comes upon a person. Now, when is jealousy a sin? When is jealousy a spirit? Well, brethren, if you give in to jealousy and continue to give in to jealousy, sooner or later, a spirit will come and take control of your life that will drive you jealously insane. Amen? And how many people out of jealousy have killed? Huh? Many, many people out of jealousy. In a fit of jealousy, they've been able to kill their mate or their mate's lover or, or imaginary lover. Because if you continue to give in to fear, sooner or later, a spirit of fear will come and take control of your life. That's what Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 calls fear. It says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. And let's call it a, a, a spirit. It's not just a feeling. It's not just an emotion. It's a spirit that comes and takes control of your life and will drive you crazy. And I've seen so many people locked up in an insane asylum because of what? Because of their fear. Amen? Fear is a sin that will damn your soul. How many have read in Revelation chapter 1 that it says that who are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone? Huh? It talks about witchcraft. It talks about adultery. But it says the fear fall. Huh? How many of you would like to spend eternity with that motley crew? With all the witches and the, and the warlocks huh? and the adulterers and adulteresses. How many of you like to spend eternity in a place like that? Just yes, because you weren't able to overcome what? Fear. Yeah. You've got to overcome your fear. And it's time you've made up your mind that you weren't going to let any kind of fear control your life. Amen? Because fear will not only destroy your body, it will destroy your soul. Fear is one of the most damaging, uh, what could we call it, feelings or attitudes that can invade the life of someone that professes the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? There's many, many other sins that are mentioned in the Bible. It would be good for you to go through. I'm, I haven't mentioned lust. Lust is a sin that affects you physically. Lust in its various manifestations. The Bible says that he that commits fornication sins, how? Against his own body. And you reap in your own body the consequences of your sin. And, and lust can be manifested through masturbation, or lust can be manifested through sodomy, or lust can be manifested through adultery, or lust can be manifested through perversion. But if you give vent to your lustful feelings, sooner or later your body is going to suffer. Let's read this, this verse in Hebrews chapter 2, brethren, because here it tells us, gives us the purpose of redemption as it pertains to fear. How many have read this verse? How many have memorized this verse? It says, for as much then as the children... That's us, those that belong to the family of God. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, Jesus Christ, himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus became incarnate. He became a man of flesh and blood. Why? It says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver. There's the ministry of deliverance. Jesus died so that the ministry of deliverance would become possible in the world today. Now, notice what it says, and deliver them that who through fear, particularly the fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What will fear do to you? Put you in bondage. And I've known people that they have so much fear of being assaulted and being uh, mugged and being raped that they won't even leave their apartment house. They become prisoners in their own apartment. I've heard of people in New York City that haven't been out of the house in 18 or 20 years. They don't dare venture out into the streets. They're afraid. And they become prisoners in their own apartment or their own house. Now, the Bible says here that through fear we are subject to bondage. The greatest fear of all, the most, the universal fear is fear of death. Now, Jesus came to deliver us from our fears. Amen? He came to deliver us from the fear of death. Jesus suffered and died. Jesus led, uh, <laughs> gave his life on the cross so that we could be delivered from all sins and we could be delivered from all spirits. Amen? And let me tell you, brethren, we should never rest until we are free. Amen? It might be a long, drawn-out process. It may take, might take months. might take years. But our goal in life should be what? To be free. Free from all sinful attitudes and practices. Free from all evil spirits. Because that's why Jesus came and wrought redemption. He, the Bible says that he took himself upon himself a, a body of flesh and blood and, and bone. He hung on a cross, 
He gave his blood. He gave his soul. He gave his life. He gave his all. Why? To deliver, verse 15, to deliver them that through fear or whatever others, whatever, whatever else, that through fear were subject all their lifetimes to bondage. Are you in bondage to greed? Are you in bondage to fear? Are you in bondage to, uh, to anger? To rebellion? What is, what thing in particular is keeping you from enjoying the freedom that God wants to give you? See, don't tolerate that. Because every one of these things can kill you. Amen? It will sap your strength. It will undermine your health. It will make you miserable, discontent. It will kill you. Amen? Now, what is the remedy for, for spirit? Deliverance. But what's the remedy for sins? Repentance. Huh? You can't repent out a demon. Huh? And you can't cast out a sin. Everything in its rightful place. But brethren, if we repent, if we correct our lives, we clean up our lives, many of the spirits that are clinging on to us just like leeches, and they're robbing us of happiness and health, what are they going to do? They're going to have to let loose, let go. They're going to have to take leave. And then we will recover uh, everything that we have lost. God is in the restoration business. Amen? God wants to restore us to the primeval condition that man had before the fall. I believe that that's God's goal today, is to bring man back into perfect fellowship with him. Amen. Spotless. Uh, sinless. Amen. Uh, let's put it this way, sickless. <laughs> we got a long ways to go. Uh, there's a lot, some people going around saying they are the manifested sons of God. I think they are full of baloney. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's entered into full sonship yet. In fact, I don't know if anybody can enter into full sonship until Jesus comes. Because the Bible talks about the adoption as the redemption of the body. But brethren, we can sure strive for it. That should be our goal. And I think we should set a goal for 1985 that we're not going to continue to tolerate these things that have been plaguing us all through 1984. Amen? Those wrongful dispositions of the heart. Those wrongful attitudes. Those wrongful thoughts. Uh, they were not going to permit Satan to have any kind of foothold in our lives. So let's give up our greed. Uh, take out your checkbook and make a check for $1,000 for Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. That'll get rid of your greed fast. Fred says it will bounce. You'd be surprised how much money some of you have got in the bank. And some of your current savings account. And you're stashing it away for a rainy day. Well, when the rainy day comes, that bank's going to be flooded and you're not going to be able to get to the money. Huh? Brethren, how do you get rid of greed? By giving till it hurts and keep on giving till it stops hurting. Uh, how do you get rid of fear? By doing the contrary. Uh, if, 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 how do we get rid of rebellion? Submitting, obeying. No matter how much it hurts our pride. I'm going to take all the necessary measures to be able to live a life that is pleasing to God. Do you think we have to sin? Like I said the other night, sin will always be a possibility, but it will never be a necessity in the life of Christians. How many can praise the Lord? Okay, let's stand. Let's stand. How many of you are, are plagued from, by some kind of disease, or some kind of sickness? Raise your hand. Come on now. You know, there's not a healthy person in this building this, this afternoon. Huh? There isn't one. You might, don't, you might only have a, a rotten tooth, but that, that's bad enough. Huh? What about your ingrown toenails? Huh? What about the itch? Huh? What about the dandruff? Now, brethren, you want to improve your health. Begin to confess your sin to the Lord. What is your sin? Is it envy or jealousy? Is it anger or wrath? Is it rebellion or disobedience? Is it ingratitude? Is it cruelty? What is your sin? The Lord's spoken to you. Why don't you raise your hands and begin to confess that sin before the Lord today. And not only confess it, but ask God for strength and for courage to turn against that sin, to overcome it, to throw or cast it out of your life, to stomp on it, to tread on it, Become victorious in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over that sin. And when that, when that sin has left your life, then you'll come into health. At least in that area of your life, you'll begin to enjoy good health. Hallelujah. You've got an eye problem, a heart problem, a skin problem, a female organ problem. You, you've discovered by my teaching yesterday and today what might be the cause of that problem. Get rid of the cause and you'll get rid of the effect. Yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, make our life beautiful. For the, your sake and for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.
lakehamiltonbiblechamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.